I'm Erica. And I'm CJ. And you're listening to the Her Podcast. Today, we have the privilege of sitting down with Kendra Weenie. Kendra is an award-winning author, keynote speaker, and workshop facilitator from the Sweetgrass First Nation. In 2020, she co-founded the Indigi Fund, a nonprofit empowering Indigenous youth in the areas of sport, education, and culture. In 2023, Kendra created the Indigenous Women's Empowerment Summit, an inspiring event filled with storytelling, humor, resources for healing, and connection. Although she has her own challenges as a single mother, she believes that true success comes from our ability to help others in need. Her goal is to help you move forward in a healthy way. Today, we chat with Kendra about how she ended up in an abusive relationship and the steps she took to heal afterwards. Due to the nature of this conversation, we do want to express a trigger warning and encourage you to listen with care. What was little Kendra like? What was your upbringing yeah, just uh, getting right into it. Eh? Yeah. Do you, I mean, do you want it? We can keep talking about bowel movements <laughs> if you'd like. If that's more comfortable. Uh, no. no that's <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I'll share a bit. Yeah, so I grew up on Sweetgrass First Nation, like you guys know. Um, from the age of about five until I became an adult and I went off to, to post-secondary. Um, I lived there. I grew up with a single, single mom. Uh, I have three other siblings, an older brother and two younger sisters. And it was uh, a very, it was a very difficult life growing up on the reserve. Um, For one, because we were very poor, like when my mom, you know, left my dad and decided to be a single mother, um, she didn't, she chose to be a stay at home mom so that she could be more present for us children and so we grew up very poor. We grew up on welfare on, you know, the only time we had money was um, child tax day and, and welfare day. And we didn't have a vehicle. So it was yeah. even more difficult. And um, I guess just to give you a little bit more context, because like when I say grew up on the reserve to non-Indigenous people, <laughs> they're like, oh, okay. You know, like yeah. but they don't really know what it's like. Oh, yeah. please share. Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> they're so usually... In smaller communities like Sweetgrass, you have um, like the band office, you have maybe have a clinic, not all communities have a health clinic, Um, you have your school, and then like the band store, and that's pretty much it. You don't have any grocery stores or, you know, Which is where my thought went when you were like, you know, we were living off of welfare, but also didn't have a car. And I'm like, how are you getting food? Exactly. And the, the nearest grocery store was uh, 25 minutes away in the Battlefords. So whenever we needed groceries on those two, I'll just say like paydays, which yeah. weren't really paydays, um, my mom would have to spend like an extra 20 to $30 just to hire someone to North Battleford to go and get groceries. Like it was, oh, it was, it was tough. And um, I just remember really wanting to be involved in like after school activities and you know the older I got the more the more that I wanted which is like pretty much every other girl (laughs) yeah yeah the older we get the more the the more we want yeah yeah so it was really hard like not being able to um do the things that my friends were doing um my the friends that I had like that had both parents or you know two, two working parents and could afford it and um it's all it was also very difficult uh, growing up as the eldest daughter in my family. Oh my gosh. That come with a lot of weight? Yes. Yes. There's a lot of, um, and I've talked to a lot of other, <laughs> a lot of other women who were like the, the eldest daughters in their family. And there's just so much, for the most part anyway, there's just so much um, expectations on us. And um, so that caused me and my mom to clash quite a bit. I, I used to blame her for a lot. Um, I blamed her and I like resented her for leaving my dad because I didn't know the full story there. I didn't know what was really happening, um, because I didn't have the memory, that early childhood memory. I would have been living there in Big River First Nation from the age of like infancy up until she decided to leave. But I, I had very little memory. It was, it was crazy. And you didn't know the story with your, your 
your mom and your dad. And mm-hmm. so you were resenting your mom. Yeah, because I I loved my dad a lot mm-hmm. growing up. Like, I thought I was daddy's girl. I thought, you know, I was his favorite out of all my siblings, which, you know, I really held on to, held on to that because, um, because of the, you know, kind of shaky relationship that me and my mom had. And um, so, yeah, I resented her for leaving because I didn't know the full story. It wasn't until I became a mom myself that I found out um, the relationship was abusive emotionally and mm-hmm. sometimes physically. Um, my mom didn't share a whole lot of details with me, but you know it was enough for me to understand why she left in the first place. And you know, now that I'm a mom, a single mom myself, I really appreciate that decision that she made mm, because. Yeah. I feel like that kind of turning point in her life allowed me to make the hard choice to leave my ex-partner who was also abusive. I don't have, obviously I don't hold that resentment anymore. Thankfully, uh, my mom and I have a much closer relationship now. Um, but there was also resentment towards my dad <laughs> yeah. when I was, yeah. when I was young, because he was kind of like a hands-off parent after my mom left him um, and I kind of like later found out about other siblings that I had, other half siblings. And so, you know, the, the anger and resentment kind of grew. Um, but the one thing that really saved me and helped me to get rid of, um, a lot of the, the anger that I was holding on to was sports. Mm-hmm. So I started getting actively involved in sports as a youth, um, actually made it as far as the, the university level. I talk about that in my book. Which sport again? Volleyball. Oh, yeah. Volleyball. Yeah. I, I just, I loved sports. And it, I think it was because of that. Uh, they were like my anger management. Do you find physical activity to still be that for you? Um, I would say so, but I don't play sports right now. So it's like, it is, but then it's like, I can go and boot a soccer ball or smash yeah. a volleyball, you know, like, and, <laughs> and like pretend it's someone's face. <laughs> <laughs> Like, why are you the best volleyball player on this team? Well, because I'm picturing this <laughs> as so and so. I'm yeah. pretty mad. I'm pretty yeah. mad. Yeah, my best my best games were definitely when I was like mm. the most angry, like going mm. through a breakup or something. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, sports really helped me to get through those crucial preteen teenage years. Um, I started dating around that time and. Uh, I, I'm always like kind of shamed out when I talk about my dating years because it's, <laughs> it's just embarrassing. But I didn't really have standards at that mm. age. Like I wasn't, um, I wasn't exposed to what healthy looks like, what a healthy man or a, you know boy, I guess, at that age, what what that looks like, mm. and what it feels like to be around someone who's healthy, um, no addictions, you know, not toxic who treats you good and who's kind, you know, just a genuine person. You have brothers. Yep. So were you, I'm not trying to throw shade on your brothers or anything, but I'm <laughs> yeah. like, were your, was your relationship with your brothers at that time, like close? Um, or was that something that you were like, even in those relationships, you weren't quite experiencing possibly like healthy male relationships? Yeah. Um, so like I can equate it to me and my brother, like not getting along in high school and being like, yeah, I don't think I could. I would have looked at my brother and been like, oh, yeah, that's yes. how we should. I'm not trying to throw him under the bus because I, <laughs> I named my son after him and we have a great relationship now. But I'm just curious. Yeah. Um, so my brother actually played uh, more of like a father figure role. Ooh, yeah. Okay. Just because, you know, having an absent father meant that he was kind of put into that role. Well, he wasn't. I wouldn't say he was put into that role, but that's the role that um he assumed yeah Mm -hmm. um and he so he was like really good at providing guidance um but i would never talk talk to him about relationships yeah yeah Yeah, and that's just like um that's i would say that's more of like a cultural thing like there are certain certain things that you can't talk about with your as a female with your male sibling oh yeah it's just yeah so I, I knew that, like, I couldn't ask him for, like, relationship advice. It would just yeah. be really, like, way 
it, too inappropriate. Okay. What yeah. were other things that maybe you wouldn't talk to your brother about? Um, well, I would say mostly that at that okay. time. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's, that's like the key thing that I wouldn't, um, but the, we were quite close. Like we would travel to, um, tournaments, volleyball and soccer tournaments together, mostly volleyball. And a lot of times we played on the same co-ed teams. Oh yeah. Yeah. So we had a, we had a fairly close relationship growing up, but, um, because I think I always saw him in that like father figure role, you know, like I couldn't really. Well, it's like how you don't go to your dad for something. Cause you're like, he's going to tell me I can't do this or he's not going to want to talk about this or this is yeah. weird. Yeah, I, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Ever dreamt of waking up with lashes that are flawless and brows on point without lifting a finger? Well, Glam Lash Studio is here to make that dream a reality. If you're all about saving time in the morning while still looking absolutely stunning, this is for you. Lash extensions, brow laminations and waxes, keratin infused lash lifts and tints, the dream team for an effortlessly stunning look. Emphasis on effortless. So here's the deal. Their lash extensions bring the drama, giving your eyes that extra pop. I used to have lash extensions and I absolutely loved how it looked. Brow laminations, it's like magic for your brows, giving them that insta-worthy fluffiness. I recently had one of these and highly, highly recommend. And let's not forget about their lash lifts and tints, the not-so-secret weapon for a low-key, high-key, gorgeous look. Say goodbye to the morning makeup struggle and hello to routine as easy as hitting snooze. Your future self will thank you. Trust me. Book in today at Glam Lash Studio and let their team of extensively trained and qualified staff do the rest. Our Her listeners are getting a special code to receive a discount on their next visit. Use code HER10 when booking in with the amazing staff at Glam Lash Studio. Make sure to head on over to their Instagram page at glamlashstudio.yxe. We're all about making our mornings easier, and we're doing that with Glam Lash Studio. Don't forget to use the code HER10 to save when booking. It's time to amp up those lashes and brows because life's too short for dull eyes and you deserve to shine. Don't forget to use code HER10 when booking and connect with them at glamlashstudio.yxe. So then you keep dating and I know in your story at Evoke, you talk about what that turned into for you dating after high school. Oh, yes. Once uh, alcohol was involved. Is that what you're referring <laughs> Was that a to? whole new world? <laughs> when we introduced. So yeah, I turned into a different person when I was drinking. So then I kind of, I think I kind of figured that out that, oh, wow, I have all this confidence, you know, when I'm, the more I drink, mm. which wasn't wasn't safe but that's what I would do I would um drink a lot more than I could handle and then so I got into this toxic cycle that I know so many other women are still caught up in like even today they're I'm just more open about it Mm, yeah (laughs) um so I get into this cycle of going out to the bar or you know like a social gathering where alcohol was involved um messaging you know an old flame or connecting with someone that usually it was someone that I knew like I wouldn't just go home with a stranger but I'd like hook up with someone during a night of drinking and then wake up full of shame and but then decide if I wanted to actually enter a relationship with them or just kind of like one night stand and that's it and I was caught up in that for Um, at least a few years I don't know how I was able to do so well in my university classes yeah (laughs) while keeping up with this lifestyle like it's just it's crazy it kind of baffles me at times but I was always like a pretty good (gasps) student and so by the time I was done university I had been single for oh my gosh probably like no more than two months I was never single very long And on my grad night, I planned on going out to get wasted because a couple of my best friends at the time were like, oh, yeah, let's take you out. You know, that's such a huge accomplishment. They were all proud of me and I was proud of myself. But I had this plan to repeat that same toxic cycle that I was caught up in. So go out, have way too much to drink and then see what happens with whatever guy, you know, 
but I, I really wanted to like meet someone new and someone who wasn't indigenous. Like I was kind of set on that because, um, prior to, prior to that night, I had, I got out of a relationship with a guy who I found out two years into dating that I was too closely related to. Yeah. So that was, oh my gosh. I like wanted to throw up. I was sick for like half a year after finding that out. And I was like, I'm never dating another indigenous man again. They're all my cousins. <laughs> that would like, really that scary. <laughs> like I'm traumatizing. Like, I'm trying to read your face. I'm like, can't. <laughs> Like, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. That just sucks. It does, but like, yeah, like can you, at, on the smallest scale, that sucks. Like, there's more to be said, but I'm like, gar- oh my I God. guarantee you, though, at least one person listening mm-hmm. went through the same thing and is too ashamed to admit it yes. or talk about mm-hmm. it. Which I, I find it. is interesting and is that you're willing to be open about it because mm-hmm. I think, like, you've already identified about some of the other pieces of your story. There's a lot of things that happen in life, but people aren't willing to be open about them. Yep. Right? So yep. I am kind of curious how you've, I'm not trying to take a side tangent, but like how you've gotten to a place where you are okay to be open and share and be like, I know there's others out there who've gone through this too. Yeah. I think a big part of that was um, when I became a mom. Mm. Because I was like, I don't want my daughter to ever feel like she has to keep something in and just let it fester and turn into like a physical ailment or sickness, which is what happened to me. You know, I Mm. I experienced all of these, like I've had stomach issues, nausea since childhood, pretty much. And it was, it's something that I've gone to the doctor for that I've had like different procedures for to check you know, and nothing. They they just give me a pill for the nausea every time. Like, here's some pills that should help you out. Just take them every day. But I feel like we're just starting to, at least I feel like, enter a space where we're connecting emotional and mental mm-hmm. with the body. Yeah. You know, and for a long time that was not talked about and very disconnected, right? Yeah. That things were going on emotionally or mentally for you could not be connected with an ailment. And now it's like, oh, I think that there's research to support that now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so I'm trying really hard to um, lead by example. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Practice what I preach, not just for my daughter, but to other people that I share anything with, like whether it's uh, presentations or a workshop, Yeah, healing workshop. Yeah, if I want people to believe in what I do, believe me, then I have to like do what I'm telling them they should do, which is like yeah. share your story be honest with your kids, um, create a safe space because that's, um, I, I'm speaking specifically about like indigenous folks right now. That's how we're going to heal is mm-hmm. if we stop with that, um, shaming, we tend to shame each other quite a bit, just create a safe space for our kids to be honest with us so that they don't have to hold on to that. You know, the traumas that we go through. I want to go back to, where you were at Mm because you were um going out because you graduated and Mm -hmm. you were like no more indigenous man Mm -hmm. yeah we're done with that (laughs) and this feels like in in the rest of what you were saying you were like typically i'd like hook up with someone i knew but this is you were like no i want to find someone new here Mm -hmm. like it was like the start of something yeah right yeah so go out on my grad night uh good old colonial colonial bar in saskatoon i've been there yeah it was not a hot spot by the way (laughs) back in when was that 2012 i don't think it's ever been a hot spot (laughs) except for like people who have gone there like i feel like well i don't know it was strange like after i stopped (laughs) after i stopped drinking and like going out i kept hearing people talking about colonial i'm like what the heck now people go there (laughs) that's so strange yeah it's like um, random. It's so random. It's very random. And it's small. It's tiny. Yes. Okay, so you're you're on the dance floor yeah. of Colonial? Yeah, so I'm on the dance floor. I had way too much to drink. Um, and then I was with... We, we You know how drunk girls make friends so easily? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> it is kind of a superpower. <laughs> Actually, we just had someone here, and I was telling them about that. I was like, yeah, I met this girl at the bar bathroom once, and we were, like, instantly best friends. Right? Yeah. 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 So I, had, I made five new friends. I don't remember any of their names, but made five new friends that night, had my two best friends beside me. We were all dancing. And then um, 
I see this really tall figure on the outside of our dance circle. And I was like, holy crap, that's a tall guy. Mm. I was like, oh, he's, you know, I was kind of like looking at him, checking him out. And I was like, oh, he's actually like kind of hot, you know? And uh, he kind of reminded me of Will Smith, Mm. but I also like had way too much to drink. (laughs) And the more I drank, the hotter (laughs) the guys got around me. The more they move up the scale. Yes. You were like, Will Smith is at the colonial. Yeah. A bald Will Smith is here. Yes. Yeah. News flash. <laughs> he was bald, yeah. Oh. Yeah, and so I was like, oh my God, that guy's hot. And I like kind of nudged my friend and she's like, and I told her, like I pointed at him and she's like, okay, settle down, Kendra. Like that's a that's a big black guy. Like don't, you know. And I was like, oh no, I know him. <laughs> I recognized him. And so, you know, brave drunk Kendra goes and talks to Chris and just starts flirting right away. Like, I don't even remember what I said. Um, and then we're just kind of, I remember going back to my table for a while. My friend was trying to talk me out of it because she knew what my idea was. <laughs> she's like, no, Kendra, look, I have this really hot white guy friend for you. Like, she's trying to she's trying to get me out of it. And I was like, no, you know. Yeah, like but I- the determination of a <laughs> drunk girl. I'm just... It can't be matched. <laughs> Watch out. Watch out. Seriously. Seriously. I ended up going home with him uh, in in my vehicle. I didn't drive. I couldn't even walk after, by the time the bar was closed. And um, I don't really remember what happened after leaving the bar. I just remember like not being able to walk because I was wearing heels and I, I don't do well in heels. Like I've never done well in heels. And uh, so, I, like, I remember him carrying me to the car, and then, like, that's it. <laughs> Blacked out. And um, the next morning, woke up next to him, and I was like, oh, my God. I was scared. Mm-hmm. I was scared because I was like, holy shit, how did I get here? I don't even really know him. You know, like, I was, and then I was like, the shame set in. Because yeah. I was like, oh, my God, I I wonder what he thinks of me. You know, like, just... um I don't think I looked out the window, but like, I didn't know where I was. I didn't know where we were, Mm -hmm. but he was so kind. Like, I just remember that first day getting to know him, how kind he was. Like he cooked for me and I was like, oh my God, he's an amazing cook. So kind. He's so funny. He's not even making me feel bad about what just happened. And I'm just super like shamed out. It was like my first time with a a non-Indigenous man too. So that like, it was just like everything was new. Um, But I was really impressed with him right away because he, you know, his kindness for one, um, he he was able to like find connections with me right away, like Mm -hmm. people we knew and whatnot. And uh, then he mentioned that he's a dad to three kids. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, wow. And he just sounded like this amazing dad because he said he'd pick them up at least once a week and go and spend time with them. It's like, oh, my gosh. So I, like, I fell for him very quickly. Mm-hmm. We, we decided, like, right away that we were going to, you know, try to make it work. So what I didn't know about him at the time was he had been in jail that January. So this was in June that I met him. He had been in jail that January for physically assaulting another girl not his girlfriend he assaulted the girl that was trying to protect his girlfriend at the time wow yeah yeah just crazy like all and the thing about that i am like really po'd about uh when it comes to uh relationships is you you don't find out about these things until after leaving yeah. Right. Because mm. I was going to ask, like, when did you find that out or how? Yeah, I didn't find out until, yeah. oh, gosh, I think after the first or second time that we broke up. Mm. But by that time, I was like kind of in too deep. I was already pregnant, you know. So, yeah, there was um, it was like a roller coaster. So I was only with Chris for 14 months. Oh, the one thing, the one thing um, that I usually will mention is the age gap. Right. So I was 24 when I met him at the bar. I thought he was 27. Mm. I was like, oh my gosh, you know, he's, he looks like he's around the same age as me. But then when he started talking about like his kids and stuff, I was like, okay, he's probably not 27. And then I asked him like, how old are you? And he's like, oh, I'm 36. Mm. 
mm-hmm. 12 years 12 years older than me. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh my gosh, you do not look 36. Anyway, so um, yeah, the first couple signs of um, any kind of abuse were, and I didn't even know these existed at the time, were when we moved in together two months later, uh, there was financial abuse. I never really knew how much money he had or how much money he made. I just contributed to paying the bills. He was very secret. Yes. Okay. Okay. Very secretive and like changed the subject whenever I'd ask. So I was like, mm-hmm. okay, well, you know, I don't really want him to know how much money I have either or that I have a credit card or, you know, like all of, all of that. And then there was um, emotional abuse. So just, it was very, everything was very one-sided. Like I couldn't really have a say in um, any of the major decisions that sort of thing. Um, And then spiritual abuse. Oh. Yeah. I didn't know that was a thing either. So one of the, the, I believe it was one of the first big arguments that we had. I don't even remember what it was about. I started trying to, you know, voice my concerns, stand up for myself. And then after a while he goes, oh, well, that's not what the, that's not what the creator wants. The creator is like someone that, indigenous people will pray to yeah and it's not a part of like his cult jamaican culture at all you know like he didn't grow up with cree teachings and and whatnot like i did and so i found that very uh i found it very strange and he wasn't using it from a perspective so i want to clarify right he wasn't using it from a perspective of like my creator he was saying like your creator the creator you right yes okay because we we call we call like out god we uh, creator, right? Mm-hmm. That's how a lot of indigenous folks will refer to f- God. They'll say creator. Mm. And I just remember being really um, taken aback by that comment. And I was like, okay, that's effed up. That is so messed up. First of all, I, I pray to creator. You don't mm-hmm. like, that's my culture. Not, we don't share the same belief system. And so I knew something was off after that argument. You know, I knew that what he said wasn't right. And But I just kind of like let it go for the sake of um, trying to make this relationship work. Yeah. And then um, that November, I found out I was pregnant. By that point, I knew it was going to happen because I got sick of taking plan B. Mm -hmm. I wasn't on birth control. I had no plans on going on birth control. And... I just got sick of plan B and I was like, I don't want to take this anymore. It makes me feel like shit, you know? And I was like, well, I guess I'm going to get pregnant. Sure enough, right away. Like the next day I got pregnant and, uh, I was very, I was pretty depressed to be honest after I found out because I felt very trapped Mm -hmm. by that point. I felt very trapped and I felt like okay, well, he doesn't want to use protection because he wants to get me pregnant because he wants me to stay with him. You know, like that that was his way of trying to control me. That's how I perceived the whole situation at the time. But um, because of the the teachings that I was brought up with uh, to do with pregnant women, I was able to stop obsessing over my relationship with him and focus more on taking care of myself and my body as a soon soon to be mother mm. yeah so i stopped you know focusing on on him and like what he was really doing after work like why wasn't he, he home until like nine o'clock most nights or seven seven or nine o'clock when he was off at five you know like i stopped questioning him quite a bit um i was also like very sick too in my first trimester so that was, it was just like it was really <laughs> i did not have a good experience no. being pregnant i was sick all the time I either had a cold or the flu or like something going on with my body so December was very stressful uh Christmas time because again I still didn't know how much money we really had or what we had to spend on gifts and whatnot I love um gift giving at Christmas and like wrapping presents but I was just I felt so like so helpless like I, oh, I can't go buy anything today because I don't know how much money we have. I don't know if we can afford to pay certain bills and whatnot. And so, um, yeah, I was feeling really stressed out. And on December, I remember it was December 28th. 
it was a few days after Christmas. I just kind of like had enough with the uh, financial abuse. I just had enough. I was I was stressed out about other things too, but it was mostly that that was stressing me out. And he came home late again. Um, it was after seven o'clock and went to take a shower. And I was like, I just know he's up to something. I just know it. Mm -hmm. So I went through his phone. Sure enough, I saw uh, text messages be between him and this woman he promised he was going to stop talking to who sold drugs. And um, so by that point, I knew that about his uh, cocaine addiction, about two months into dating, he, you know, fessed up about that. But I don't think it was just cocaine. So after seeing those text messages, it's it was proof that he'd been going there during his lunch breaks mm. at work to go and get high um, at that woman's house. So I confronted him about it because I was like, oh, that's probably where all our money is going, you know, to his his addictions. And um, he did not like me trying to stand up to him. It made him very angry. And then so he starts lecturing me. And after a while, it got so repetitive. And so I was just in shock because I'd never experienced that from someone. I started recording it on my phone. Mm. I deleted it after because I was scared of him. But yeah. I went, I remember going back to that recording and it was like, I'm not even kidding, like 30 minutes of him just lecturing me nonstop. Well, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I'm just sitting there thinking, you know, I have never experienced abuse like that in a relationship, but I know that sometimes after I've heard an experience like that, sometimes you're like, you start questioning yourself and you're like, did that happen? Did he actually say that? So I'm wondering if even just being able to like hear the recording back gave you confidence to know that what he was doing was not okay. Um, yeah, I knew it was messed up. Okay. I knew yeah. it was messed up, yeah. but like when you're, when you're in an abusive relationship, they're really, abusers are really good at making you feel like you're the only person in that situation. Mm -hmm. And they're really good at cutting you off from the outside world. So people that you were once close friends with, um, family members that they know you're close to. Um, so yeah, I, I was feeling pretty cut off by that point and I'd only been with him what, um, maybe seven months, wow. seven or eight months. Yeah. And to add on a pregnancy, mm -hmm. right? Like that's, yeah, that's very yeah. convoluted. Yeah. Yeah, your brain's like your brain plays tricks on you when you're pregnant. It's, mm. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, after the 30 minutes or whatever, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm sick of this. I got up and I walked into um, the bedroom. And then he dials that woman's number and he says, um, yeah, she she thinks I'm, I'm cheating on her with you. And I was like, I never said you're cheating. And then the, the woman's just kind of like scoffing, scoffing at his, uh, his comment. And I was like, Oh my gosh. And I felt like I was going to go crazy. So I tried leaving that room again, but he blocked me. He, he, sh I remember he, uh, cut the phone call off and then he, he pushed me down so I wouldn't leave. And by that point, I was like really scared of him. And I, I remember my body started shaking like uncontrollably and I started hyperventilating. And then um, after he got off the phone, he tried to like console me, but he was making me feel even more claustrophobic because he was like hugging me from behind. And then by the time I got up, I just remember after a while, he, he was carrying me down the stairs like from behind. And uh, we got to the the front door and I screamed. I just had this urge to like scream as loud as I could. We lived in a duplex, so I think I was hoping that the neighbors would hear. Sorry, was he <clears throat> carrying you out of the house because he was mad at you? No, he was carrying me downstairs because we slept in the basement and that was oh, the biggest room, the biggest it. bedroom. Yeah. I kept telling him that I wanted to leave and he didn't want me to. So I think that's why he was carrying me down there. And then after I screamed, he shoved his fingers down my throat and he said, shut the F up. I'm not going back to jail. Mm. 
So I think at that point, um, I kind of had a sense that this wasn't the first time, you know, he'd treated a woman like this. Um, and I was really scared of him. I remember praying really hard. So the one, um, I would say most important teaching that I was brought up with was that power of prayer. Mm. And I remember praying really hard because um, I was I was really scared by that point in the bedroom in the basement. Um, I could tell he wasn't really sure like what to do next. And uh, he's like, "Well, if you're gonna go, like you gotta leave me money." And I was like, uh, "I don't really have money, but like, how much do you need?" And he was saying that he needed to he needed money to go and take his kids out the next day because that's what he said he was going to do. I was like, okay, let's go pull out money then. Like, you can take me to go pull out money. And I was just, like, saying yes to everything because I was really scared at this point. And um, and then after a while, um, I remember, like, hearing a, a voice, a voice, like, talking to me. And um, <clears throat> it was, like, telling me to calm my breathing so that I could, you know, think more clearly. And so I kind of like, I tuned him out, but it was strange because I, I don't even remember doing this, but I packed an overnight bag in a backpack, like full of clothes. And so I had my backpack on and I was standing by the car waiting for him. He was searching around for the keys. And then the voice um, tells me to start walking. And I was like, okay. And it was like minus, like it was freezing. It was like minus 30 out. And, but I was just like, I don't know why, but I feel like I have to listen to this voice. Like, I feel like it's trying to help me. Um, because it, it just like came out of nowhere after I finished praying in the basement. And so I started walking. And then after a while, I was near this um, kind of hidden alleyway. There was a sidewalk near our back alley and Chris had pulled up with uh, my car and he yelled for me to get in and then the voice told me to run and I was like oh my god okay you know so I just started sprinting like I didn't really know where I was going sprint I sprinted on t until I like ran out of breath and then I had this urge sudden urge to hide like hide behind uh, a vehicle and I was on a sidewalk, like a main street. And I was like, oh, shit. Yeah, I should hide. So I, I hid behind this vehicle. And then not long after, he came around the corner, like, really slow in my car. Probably, well, looking for me, obviously. And then when I no noticed that he was out of sight, I started running again. And after a while, I think I, I went about 10 blocks um, I was going to stop at the Tim Hortons there by the mall, but mm -hmm. I was like, oh no, he's going to see me. Like that's too out in the open. So I walked um, much further to the 7-Eleven and then I asked for them to call the cops. And I was just, oh, it was such an awful, because this was like right after Christmas, you know, right before New Year's. It was such an awful feeling having to go and um, spend the night in a, uh, at the YWCA. Mm. Yeah. It's almost like, well, right now, because I've done so much work, like 10 years worth of healing and help helping myself, it's, it's almost like a bad dream. Yeah. It doesn't feel like it, it actually happened to me, but the details are all still there, which wow. is like kind of crazy. Yeah. The other thing is though, the, the emotions and the senses I don't really tune into as I'm sharing. So mm. I think that says a lot for how far I've come with my healing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he spent New Year's in jail. This is another situation that I'll go into a little detail, detail about that I don't normally share um, in presentations or anything. But I do talk about it in my book um, because it was almost like a little victory for me at the time. Um, almost like... Um, oh, wow, I can stand up for myself. Um, so he was on the run for a few days. Um, the police didn't know where he was. Uh, he, I think he returned my vehicle, but then he like just 
left the keys and my wallet at the duplex we were staying at and just took off with his vehicle. And I was moved out. I had I had to move back to my mom's in Sweetgrass. I had nowhere else to go. He left me in debt, like thousands of dollars of debt because I just had to like up and move. Didn't get our damage deposit back. And um, I was like, I bet he's at his stepsister's place. I couldn't really think of anywhere else that he would go. I was like, I bet he's there. And so I called there like three, four days, I think, after, after the, that night. So I was talking to her and uh, I had to put on this, this act as I was talking with her. And then I heard him in the background. I was like, oh, I knew it. He's there. That's where he's staying. Because the cops, you know, were looking for him. They didn't know where he was. And then I made an excuse to end the phone call. And then I called the cops. I called the city police, told them this is where he is. I just heard him. And, you know, his, I think I mentioned that his stepsister said that he was there. And then they showed up. I think four, four police showed up. Like I heard from her afterwards that four big police officers came to pick him up. And then he spent New Year's in prison. Mm. Yeah. So at the time I, I felt like pretty good about that, you know, but then because I was in such a vulnerable state and feeling so low and I was like, crap, I don't want to be a single mom. I also don't want my child growing up without a dad, you know, because for me, that was very difficult. And so I was like, I, I was like, you know what? Um, maybe he is really sorry. Mm. You know, he, he didn't hit me. He didn't hit me. Um, I really downplayed like what he actually did and put me through that night. Mm. I was like, you know, I think he still loves me because he, he didn't hit me. You know, I don't think he'd ever hit me. And so I told myself that same story um, after I decided that I was going to get back together with him. If you want to brighten up your smile quickly and easily, then you have to try BW Beauty's at home organic teeth whitening kit. You guys, I love this kit because it only takes 20 minutes per session. And you guys, I love a habit stack and you can use a habit stack here. Put on your teeth whitening and then take that 20 minutes to read a book, listen to a podcast, unwind, watch a show, catch up on some messages. Your teeth will be whiter in no time. BW Beauty offers safe dental grade whitening in the comfort of your home with their kit. BW Beauty's whitening gel is the perfect balance of active ingredients. It has stain removing toughness with little to no sensitivity and it is expertly crafted and formulated by dental professionals here in Canada. You guys, these products are a favorite among dentists so you know you're using the best at home. The kit includes super detailed and easy to follow instructions to make the process a breeze. Each kit is going to give you a minimum of 12 at home whitening sessions. That breaks down to a cost of $10 per session. Let's compare that to like a $600 whitening treatment in a dental office. Ordering from BW Beauty for their whitening kit is a no brainer. And you guys, we have an exclusive discount code for you. Use the code HERSMILE at checkout to save 10% off of your kit online. This is such a great offer because you can order it no matter where you're listening from. You're going to want to head to bwbeautyyxc.com to order your home organic teeth whitening kit or follow them at bwbeautyyxc on Instagram. And again, use code HERSMILE, H-E-R-S-M-I-L-E to save 10% off on your order. I don't remember how long he was in jail. I think about a week or two. And then we got back together. We moved in together later on that year in May, this time in North Battleford. And I thought I was being smart. I thought I was being smart this time because I was like, I'm going to make him put all the bills in his name. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to be abused financially anymore. You know, I don't want to be taken advantage of. I don't even have money. Like I, um, I think I was substitute teaching at the time. That's not a lot of money with that. And 
And uh, I was in a lot of debt because of that move, just having to like uproot my life and move back to the reserve. And I was really shocked because he did not, uh, he had, he didn't have like good credit, I could tell, but he said yes to all of my demands. Like, I was like, you're going to have to move to North Battleford if you want to stay together. I'm not moving back to Saskatoon. He's like, okay. I was like, and you're going to have to work. You're going to have to find full-time employment, you know, because I don't want to work. I'm huge. You know, I had like this huge, I looked like I was having twins. Like (laughs) (laughs) I was humongous. Um, And he's like, okay. You know, and I was like, and you're going to have to put all the bills in your name because I have like, I owe like $3,000 on my credit card. You know, like I thought I was being really smart. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, he must really love me to be able to sacrifice all this from do all this for me Mm -hmm. but the reality is he had nowhere else to go he had nowhere to go right you know so i was like his last resort and um when we moved in together his anger outbursts grew to be more frequent and because i was like you know really big and pregnant i couldn't help myself i just learned to just shut up and let him be right Mm -hmm. in all of our arguments. I learned that it's not smart to try and argue with him because when I did try to stand up for myself, um, he would yell even louder, uh, tell me to shut up or throw, slam a piece of furniture to the ground. And so I was like, okay, I can't, I'm just gonna let him be right. You know, I I was constantly walking on eggshells, like the latter part of my pregnancy. And then our daughter Kalea was born on August 9th of 2013. And then when I was, uh, I had her through a C-section when, when I was recovering from that C-section for five days in the hospital. Oh my God, that was awful. Um, I still experienced all the, all the labor pains, everything for no one tells you that I had a C-section with my first yeah. And I remember like having contractions after and I was like, excuse me. Yeah. I thought the C-section meant I bypassed this crap. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I thought my stomach was out. ripping. I was like, so I, I remember saying to my husband, something is happening. Call a nurse. And the nurse is like, no, those are your contractions. And I was like, rude. Sorry. I just yeah. understand that piece I, a little yeah. bit. It I sucks. Was, I was in labor for 16 hours Ew. and they're like, Oh, by the way, you have to have a C-section. I was like, well, you could have told me that when I got here, <laughs> like hour Frick. one would have been great. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. That was, it was awful. And he was just kind of like coming and going in the hospital too. So I don't know what the heck he was up to. I didn't really care at that point. Cause I, um, in the hospital, I was really impressed with, um, the nurses, you know, it, it's, I find it ironic almost because when I talk to other Indigenous women, visibly Indigenous women, who have to go and give birth at that same hospital, their experience are almost always horrible. Mm-hmm. And it's the nurses because they're Indigenous, you know, mm-hmm. like they, they treat them differently. But for some reason, I lucked out and I had amazing nurses and they took really good care, care of me. I felt so safe there. So I was, I felt, I remember feeling really grateful for that. And so that kind of helped me not to really care too much about what he was doing when he wasn't, you know, there. And, um, yeah, so it was, it was really tough physically. I remember leaving the hospital and I had to like hold on to the side, like the railing because all that extra weight, like I was, and then I couldn't breathe. Like it was crazy, like how much my body went through, um, yeah, so my my new focus then, again, after praying really hard in the hospital, was uh, just my own well-being and Kalea's well-being. Like, that was my new focus. I was like, you know what? If he wants to change, he'll do it. Um, if he wants to stay together, you know, he'll try really hard to change, to step up, be a good dad, quit his addictions. Mm. But the other thing I prayed for was a way out because I was like, if that's what's meant, then, you know, please help me to leave, leave this. And um, when Kalea was just eight days old, my prayers were answered. So he was out late again. And I 
had that gut feeling that, okay, he's not really at the gym because it's been four hours. He, there's no way that a 30, seven-year-old man can stay at the gym for four <laughs> hours and it's 9 p.m so i was like okay hey, yeah i know he's lying i called him and um he was at a bar uh just outside north battleford celebrating supposedly with you know co-workers or something and i i was like i remember hanging up and i was just furious and i was like okay thank you that's my sign Mm-hmm. that's my sign that he's not going to change and that I should leave. Mm-hmm. I should leave while he's there, mm-hmm. you know, and I couldn't really move around too quickly. And, um, but I made a really big mistake after hanging up. I sent him one final text oh. saying that we're going to go stay with my mom for a while. I don't want Clea growing up around drugs and alcohol, you know, because we didn't. And, um, that like I kept it very brief and I put my phone away, shut my ringer off. And I don't know how the heck he got there so quickly, but I was only about 20 minutes into packing and I heard the living room door just slam shut. And so I knew it was him and I knew he was furious. And um, I won't go into too much detail about, you know, what happened next because it's pretty awful. But um, he goes and he picks up our little sleeping Kalea And then again, he starts lecturing me. Why are you trying to leave me? Why are you trying to let our daughter grow up without it? I thought you loved me. Don't you love me? You know, it was always my fault. And um, she started crying, like when he started raising his voice. But after a while, not not long after, she just went silent. And that's kind of, that kind of freaked me out because I've never seen a crying baby just go silent, you know? So she was traumatized too, obviously. Um, But very fortunately, by the time that we got out of there and were taken to the hospital, um, she was unharmed. Um, I'm really, you know, I still feel, I don't don't want to say guilty, but like it bothers me that she had to witness that. Mm -hmm. And that's all she knows of her dad, Mm -hmm. you know, is that night. I suffered from a concussion after that, um, had a very swollen head and, uh, it took a long time for like my body to, to heal, not just from that, but from the C-section, like, oh my gosh. Um, and then he was in jail for a measly two weeks. He was let out on electronic monitoring, stayed at his stepsister's. Yeah, if people want to know more, they can read my book because I mm-hmm. go into a lot of detail about, you know, the aftermath, mm-hmm. which is even harder. It's not the act of leaving that is the most difficult for victims. It's what comes after. For you, what was helpful um, after you left? Like what helped you get to a place that you're in now, right? Um, honestly, I like the, the first thing, prayer mm-hmm. for sure. Mm-hmm remembering and because I didn't just pray when I needed help after that I prayed every day because I was so thankful just to have survived that experience and to be able to have that chance to turn my life around and set a better example for Kalea even if that meant being a single mom yeah yeah but the other thing um my family yeah yeah Kalea's got two amazing aunties uh, my two younger sisters and an amazing uncle, um, my brother. My brother helped us out financially a lot. We even lived with him for a while, him and his family. Um, and then my mom too, like she was Kalea's primary uh, babysitter. Like when I, you know, had work or um, when I was living with my mom often, off and on since Kalea was born. Yeah, so I would say those two things for sure were like the biggest do you think telling your family what was going on was a big piece in, I mean, did they already know before you left or was it afterwards that you were like, I have to tell you what's going on? They, they, they knew he was abusive okay, because they, know. they knew about the, the after Christmas incident. Right. Cause I had to go and live with my mom after yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Um, so you said, obviously your family was a big support system for you. Mm-hmm. Prayer. Yeah. 
what else have you done? Because you talked about it even just as you were sipping your water and you're like, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing to see how far I've come from this trauma. Yeah. I'm wondering if you can speak to other avenues you tried yeah. that maybe you were like, eh, that wasn't for me. Or you're like this, this was a big part in getting to a place that I can sit on a podcast and talk about this. Yeah. And we still see the effects, right? You're like, yeah. my throat's dry, but yeah, you've also come very far. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I would say, well, in the first few years, I did a lot. Like, I, I had no idea how to help myself. So I just tried everything that I could access um, for free, you know, most of the time. Yeah. Because I was a single mother on the reserve. Um, very limited source of income. I was on maternity EI, you know, so that doesn't really cover anything <laughs> when you're single. And... Um, I had a vehicle for a while, you know, so I had to uh, go with what I had access to at the time, which was counseling. Um, So I go to counseling once a week, once my face was healed, that helped a lot because it it makes a huge difference when you feel safe and not judged by the person that you're talking to. Mm -hmm. And when they're not like a friend or family member, that's huge too. So counseling, um, I started going to Reiki sessions. There was, mm. there's a woman that lives in Sweetgrass who's just very gifted and just very kind. Like she just got such a kind, soft spoken manner. And so you feel safe around her. So I go to see her when I could afford it. I started being more or trying to be more, uh, <laughs> I wanted to say more, more uh, indigenous. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, go there. What did that look like for you? (laughs) What I I mean by that is just like more involved in my culture and practicing it on a daily basis Mm -hmm. rather than just when it was convenient or when I needed help. Because a lot of young people um, do that. Like they'll only pray when they need help or they're scared or sad or, you know, or turn to their their culture or belief system when, when they need help. Yeah. So instead of, you know, having that way of thinking, because I was so thankful You know, so thankful that prayer saved me twice. I I decided that I was, you know, going to be more, um, just practice my belief system more. Um, I, what else? Oh my gosh, I did so much. TRE, that stands for Tension and Trauma Release Exercises. That really helped. I did that when Kaleo was about six months old, but it costs money, you know? So like I was kind of limited as to when I could go to those uh, workshops But then after you go to like one or two, you can do them on your own at home, which is what I did for at least a year or two after. Um, I started playing sports again. That really helped to boost my confidence. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because as you're saying this, I'm like, I think for some people, it'd be really easy to turn to like alcohol Mm -hmm. to like numb. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I mean, alcohol was something that you had used in the past to be confident. Yeah. Yeah. What was it for you that was like, and I I actually don't know if you ever dabbled in that as your, you know, your therapy, but I'm assuming with what you've said, you didn't. Um, Like, what was that decision process for you? Were you like, there's no way I'm doing this? Or what did that look like? Oh, my gosh. Um, I wanted to drink so bad, but I was nursing. So that kind of cut me off. (laughs) No, but do you want, that's why I'm asking, because I'm like, I, you haven't said that you did that, but I'm Mm -hmm. like, is there, and I think, um, being open to being like, um, sometimes we hear stories and people are like, yep, I just, I knew I wasn't going to do that. But instead you're like, no, I really, really wanted to actually partake in this to help maybe numb or whatever. And it was really your daughter who kind of kept you from from doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't really talk about that enough, but definitely... I think the way I describe her in my book is uh, she she's a gift. She is a gift. And with Indigenous people, that's how a lot of um, the our elders will talk about children. They're, they're a gift and they're loaned to us. And so when she was born, it, it was crazy how I remembered a lot of these teachings that I had heard from like elders, from my... My late grandma or Gukam, I used to, Mm -hmm. uh, that's how we say grandma in Cree. Mm -hmm. Even at the times when I would um, try to feel sorry for myself uh, because I was a single mom, you know, and it's really freaking hard. Like, I was like, well, she's a gift, you know, she's not, she's loaned to you. Like, you gotta try your best to, 
take care of yourself so that you're not resenting single parenting so much. Mm. Yeah. So I have to positive self-talk. That's another thing I just remembered. That's one thing that I had to teach myself. What did positive self-talk look like for you? Um, were you like journaling, looking in a mirror, just saying it in your head, saying it out loud? Initially, it was like when I look at myself after getting ready in the morning in the mirror, I would say one nice thing about myself, even if I didn't believe it. I was like, you know what? Um, this one woman at the mall told me I have nice hair, so I'm going to say I have nice hair today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and yeah. the more that I did that on a daily basis, the more I started to believe it and like, you know, hold my head high. I used to walk like hunched over all the time. I noticed like when I, back in my teens and early twenties, when I had a very low self-esteem and that's the one thing I noticed, like the huge difference now is because of that positive self-talk, um, that myself and a lot of other young women don't learn to do when, when you start doing that every single day, even if you don't believe it, you know, like you start to hold your head a little higher each day. And you appear confident, even if you don't feel confident, you appear like you have confidence. Yeah, and it's rewiring our brains, right? Mm -hmm. Rewiring how we think about ourselves. And I think as women, we sometimes get caught into this awkward place of, um, like, if we speak nicely about ourselves, we're being like arrogant, Mm -hmm. right? And instead being like, no, I'm just showing myself some love. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, And we even struggle as women when people tell us, oh, you have beautiful hair, right? We're instantly like, no, you like we we <laughs> gonna deflect it right back. Deflect. Yeah. I mean, my big thing is people are you know whenever someone says I look nice, I'm like thanks, I showered. Like I can't just be like thank you, exactly. Right? We even yeah. it is. I'm literally like I just assume it's because I showered. People are noticing this about me. Um, you've done such amazing work by bringing awareness to this and speaking about it. And you know, we always I mean like name it to tame it, right? Like really even before when we were talking about how open you are about dating your cousin um (laughs) but it is it brings it 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 really opens the door for other people to share their experience and that's how we're going to learn and grow and i just really appreciate you doing that um both at the evoke conference and here with us today yeah so amazing kendra yeah thank you so much um what is the best piece of advice you've ever been given or that you like to give Oh, that's a good one. Um, It was from my mom. And it was a sporting analogy, actually. Here we go. (laughs) Sports analogy. Um, So I was struggling because uh, I I used to really like take competition to heart, sports to heart, like especially volleyball. Um, And this is around the age where I, you know, wasn't on the the university team anymore after that horrible experience that I had, I decided I wasn't going to go back. And, um, but like sports still really mattered to me and I always had to win, you know, and, um, Oh yeah. I'll explain the details a bit just so you understand the, the piece of advice. Um, so I was having issues with, with teammates on teams that I was on. I was like, Oh my God, I, I was telling my mom complaining. I was like, I always have to do all the work. Like it's so frustrating and you know, it, it's exhausting. I don't know why I'm the one that always has to like, you know, be the go-to person when we're losing or, you know, and, and then she said, um, try not to focus on your teammates so much because when you do your best, when you try your best, you're never going to feel bad after a game. Hmm. And so I kind of applied that analogy, not just to sports, but to life, you know, like whether it's um, jobs that I've had, I've always done my best in like every single job that I've had. And so when, when I've left, you know, certain workplaces or if I've um, completed projects and whatnot, like I don't feel bad because I gave it my all. So that it doesn't just apply to sports, you know, it's, it, it was also like really, um, wise life advice. Oh, that's great advice. That's Mm -hmm. definitely something you can apply to everything. Cause I think so often, you know, we can look at other people and we should be, you know, looking internally and being like, did we do our best? And Mm -hmm. if we did our best, then we should be proud. Mm -hmm. So that's fantastic. Um, I'd love for you to leave the audience with um, where they can connect with you. So probably like your website, your social media, um, what your book is called, which 
can probably be purchased on your website or where it can be purchased and any other resources um, that you want to share? Yeah, for sure. Um, So Facebook, um, my business page is Kendra Weenie Speaking and Workshops. My Instagram is at Kendra.Weenie. My website is www.kendraweenie.com. And um, I actually have a a women's event next March that is featured on my website. So if you want to learn more about that, you can go there. Um, Yeah, or just email kendraweenie at gmail.com. Amazing. We'll have everything in the show notes so that people can check it out. Um, But thank you so much. Like Mm -hmm. I echo what Erica said for coming on, sharing your story, being so open um, and sharing with us today. Thank you. No problem. Thanks for having me. Yay. (laughs) Thank you everyone for joining us on this episode of the Her Podcast. If you want to follow along with us, you can find us on Instagram and TikTok at it's.her.podcast. We can't wait to see you there.